Thank you for joining us and welcome to the Hollyhock Fellowship Program informational webinar. This will be about 30 minutes, about 15 to 20 minutes of content and 10 to 15 minutes of uh, questions if there are any. Let me go ahead and get started. Here's a picture of our most recent cohort, the 2019 uh, fellows. Don't they look happy, excited to be at Stanford, a part of the Hollyhock Fellowship Program? Um, let me go ahead and just tell you our agenda. We're going to do a short set of introductions of who's on the webinar sharing the materials tonight, then describe to you what is Hollyhock, why you should apply, and whether or not you meet the criteria. And then, of course, we're going to have one fellow share his experience and then end with some question and answers. So first, we're going to start with introductions. Uh, my name is Melissa Sheevy, and I'm the director of the Hollyhock Fellowship Program. It's been a great privilege for me to work with this program since its inception, since its inception in 2014. Now I'm going to turn it over to Molly to introduce herself. Hi, everyone. My name is Molly Simpson. I'm the program coordinator for the Hollyhock Fellowship. And I'll turn it over to Charles. Hi, I'm Charles Peters. I'm a 2018 Hollyhock Fellow. I'm here to share my experiences uh, with the program. Thank you, Charles and Molly, for joining us. And let's go ahead and get started. So what is the Hollyhock Fellowship? It's a two-year professional learning experience for early career teachers who come in school teams of three to five and work in schools where at least 50% of the students qualify uh, for free and reduced lunch. Uh, our typical school is actually 80%, but the cutoff is um, 50%. And the goals of the program are really all around collaboration. One of the things that really makes Hollyhock unique is that because it's a program where that you get to opt into and you get to obviously volunteer to be a part of it, it's really up to you as, I say this all the time to fellows, it's your program, what you want to make of it. And so it's really meant to be a collaborative model where we work on four things together. First of all, we have a set of what we call core practices that we work on with teachers in each content area. And we help invite teachers to think about how they wanna develop their instructional capacity in terms of those core practices. Secondly, because we spend so much time in content, I think what's nice about it is sometimes at it, it, your districts or at your network, um, the focus of the PD is general PD across all contents. And most of our PD professional learning in both the summer and the school year is actually content specific. And so you get a lot of um, help and support and consideration of your pedagogical content knowledge. Third, we really focus on this issue of equity. Like, how do you want to take up equity in your classroom? How do your own um, privileges and biases maybe impact the way that you engage with your students? How do you as a school team want to work on issues of equity at your school site? And of course, most importantly, how do you want to create equitable learning environments in your classroom? And then finally, we really want to help you build a community across your cohort, across your content area, across all the teachers from the different states who apply. We've had teachers from 33 different states and, the wa and Washington, D.C. be a part of the program. And then, of course, how do you want to make that community back at your school? And then finally, just kind of the nuts and bolts. It is a two-year fellowship. You spend two weeks in residence for two summers at Stanford. This is all paid for. There's no cost to the teacher or the school. And then you have video-based coaching sessions, much like this, except that you would be able to see your coach and talk to them, and it wouldn't be in a webinar format. It'd be more in a video conference format. And I think Charles will talk a little bit about that when he, we turn it over to him for his experiences. And those video-based coaching uh, sessions take place once a month during the school year to take up the work that you worked on during the summer. So it's basically, we hope, an iterative learning experience. So now that we've talked a little bit about what is the Hollyhock Fellowship, we're going to talk about why apply to Hollyhock. And I forgot to mention during the introductions, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat, um, and then we will take your questions at the end of the webinar. So why should you apply to Hollyhock? Well, let me share a little bit about um, what we think are some of the really positive parts of the program. First of all, every year we ask the teachers, how does Hollyhock compare to other professional learning experiences that, that you've had as teachers? You as teachers have a, are very savvy consumers. You have a lot of different choices in how you develop as professionals. And we're excited to share that 98% of all fellows since the inception of the program report that Hollyhock is better than any other professional learning that they've, they've engaged in. 
Um, we're also happy to share that we have a very diverse cohort of teachers across America. Teachers come from all kinds of different uh, demographic backgrounds, from all different types of states. Um, we have both rural and urban schools. We have both comprehensive public and magnet and charter. 50% uh, of the teachers who are in the fellowship are teachers of color, and 40% are first generation college grads. I mentioned the piece about collaboration, about what is Hollyhock, but I think this is one of the things that is the lever, and I hope Charles will mention this a little bit in his experience, that's really, really nice about Hollyhock. Because we're not your employer, because we're not your you know, supervisor or evaluator or anything, the space is totally safe and non-evaluative, meaning when you share your practice, you share a classroom video, or you rehearse in front of a group of teachers, we're just all kind of here to cheerlead each other and support each other in working on our practice so we can take risks and develop. And so it's all about feedback. It's not at all about evaluation. We use no rubrics to evaluate teachers. Everything is in terms of like, what's your professional learning and goal and how do you want to develop based on what um, we've taught at the Summer Institute. Um, it's also an asset leaning program, uh, meaning we really try to lead with assets. What are your assets as a teacher? What are your students' assets? What are the assets of your school? How can we position that in a positive way? Too often teachers are maligned and um, you know that the whole profession is often maligned and we're, we're the opposite of that. We celebrate teachers, we celebrate the profession, we try to uplift the very important work. Our belief is that without teachers, in the profession, we have nothing. We have no future to our country without people willing to do the very hard work of educating our future generation. It is, of course, uh, why you should apply. It's fully funded with a generous stipend. So um, again, there's no cost to you. All travel, room, and board is paid for when you come in the summer. The video-based coaching is all on platforms that are paid for. The classroom video app is paid for, the instructional coaches, the professional learning. And there is a stipend of $2,000, $500 in four different increments over the two years. And then finally, we just completed our first um, longitudinal study. And because we are a teacher professional learning program, we're excited to share that 86% of all of our alumni dating back to 2014 are still teaching. And they have the other 14% that are not teaching, many of them are still in schools, but just now in school leadership positions. And on average, our alumni are in their ninth year of teaching. This kind of blows out of the water all the data on teacher turnover. Um, and we're very excited about that. The last slide I'm gonna share before I turn it over to Charles is whether or not you meet the criteria. So um, when you apply, so the applications are due by January 15th, when you apply, you can be currently in your second year, but no more than your seventh year of teaching. And that's because of the data that we know, um, the educational research around early career. Usually, if teachers are going to leave the profession, they're going to leave earlier in their career. And that's why we have those markers of second to seventh year. The reason why we don't accept brand new teachers into the fellowship is our experience has been brand new teachers, although very awesome and wonderful, tend to be working on general pedagogy moves in their classroom, things like classroom management, how to plan lessons, how to backwards plan a unit. And we are really getting into the content specific pedagogy of how to be a more effective English teacher or math teacher, et cetera. So that's why we have that second year, but no more than seventh year. So right now, if you're in your seventh year, you would be starting the fellowship in your eighth year. And right now, if you're in your second year, you would be starting the fellowship in your third year. Um, you do have to focus on a professional area. Now, if you are a special ed teacher or an English language learner teacher, that is fine. We really welcome you to apply. You do have to pick a content area. So it's important to have a conversation with your school leader, especially if you're like a special ed teacher who normally pushes into math classrooms this year, but next year you might be pushing into history classrooms and co-teaching in that context, then we would of course um, need to know like which content area would you be most likely to support over the next two years to then be in that um, content area for the fellowship work. That includes like the coaching, the content specific coaching, as well as the professional learning sessions uh, in the summertime. A again, also for um, ELS teachers, they typically apply in English, but you can obviously apply in any content area depending on what you support at your school. 
Um, you do need to make a commitment to stay at your current school for at least two more years. And so we want the teams that apply from your school to stay intact. And in order to do that, um, you do need to make that commitment. So if you're applying this year, that would mean that you would stay at your school for the 20, uh, 2021 school year and the 2021 22 school year, if I'm saying that correctly. Am I saying that correctly? I think so. Um, definitely need to be facile with technology. We do a lot with classroom video. Uh, we do a lot of things over a Zoom video conference. We're absolutely willing to teach anyone, but you do need to have access to a lap laptop or uh, a pad, an iPad or a phone in order to engage with the work of Hollyhock. You do also need to have a school team apply. Now, I've gotten a lot of questions about this. What if I can't find enough people at my school site? If you are in a situation like you're in a rural context where there's not enough early career teachers, we have made exceptions where we've allowed you to have teams apply across a district. We've also done that with some charter networks that aren't particularly large, but generally, and maybe Charles, you can speak to this, we would prefer it that teams are at the same school site because our experience has been if you're at different school sites, it's really hard to work together as a school team. But you can reach out to us individually to see if we would make an exception if you have questions about that. And then, of course, the school context needs to be 50% free and reduced lunch. That is our cutoff. We've accepted a few teams that have been like 48 or 49%, but generally, most of our schools are actually on average 80 to 90% free and reduced lunch. And so hitting that 50% FRL is an important criteria. Um, finally, just we want people who want to learn and grow as teachers like, um, you know, we are we are in this to work with you to have thought partner conversations. Again, this is not a valuative a safe space. And um, we're excited if you want to learn and grow. We want to learn and grow with you. Um, that's it for my part of the informational webinar. I'm now going to turn it over to Charles um, to talk about his experience. And Charles, if you can just cue me up as to when you want me to um, move each bullet point forward, that would be awesome. Okay, no problem. And I appreciate it. Um, I value this opportunity to talk to um, prospective, I guess, uh, new fellows. Um, the first bullet that I wanted to touch on tonight was um, the foundation itself. And Go ahead. It's views on education and critical uh, pedagogy. I think it's important for anyone that's interested in this program to have um, a, a, a hold, a firm hold on their personal views of education in America and what that means to them uh, from a historical context, but also personally. Um, I do believe that the education system as it was intended was not made for marginalized communities to find a voice and be empowered. And being that that is in line with my um, pedagogy approach, pedagogical approach, I think Hollyhock also caters to that need for um, students in disenfranchised areas and communities to find a voice and share a voice and for their experiences to come into the classroom and be heard and also inform the teaching and the lessons. You could go ahead, Melissa. Thank you, Charles. Yep. You could hit the next one too. Um, I think Melissa was just talking about the need to be in your um, third year. Well, she said into your second year, between your second and seventh, I entered in my third year of teaching, which for me came at the perfect intersection of my comfort level in the classroom. And by that, I mean um, pacing, classroom management, um, understanding what was coming next before it happened. In your first couple of years, it's very hard to um, foresee those things because you have to have the time on the floor and in the room. There's not a internship program, a student teaching program that can fully prepare you for what it's like to uh, manage a classroom of um, sometimes 30 plus students, um, to learn how to lesson plan um, efficiently and effectively. So those first two years, you're figuring all that out, figuring it out, and there's a part of your creativity and maybe even a license that you don't feel that you have at the time because you have so many other things to figure out. But in your third and fourth year and beyond, you start to feel more comfortable, um, for lack of a better term, manipulating the lesson plans and shifting your pedagogy, trying best practice, new best practices, taking advice and tips and um, examples from other places. So Holly High come came at a time for me when I was ready to bring that part into my classroom. And uh, I think that's important for anyone considering the program. Okay, Melissa, I'm sorry. Finding your tribe. 
Um, Holly Hawk has connected me to other educators around the country, um, but also right in my school, right? So this is twofold for me. Um, I'll start more personally in my school. There were two other teams that came before my team and there's a Holly Hawk team after my team. So we have four years um, running of teams. So in the building, there's a certain understanding of the risk that we take because we've been through Holly Hawk, because we've had these conversations, because we've had this intense coaching and this care given to us by the Holly Hawk team. So when we challenge each other and ask each other questions, there's not a pushback or a funny face that's being made because we're asking about a, a move or um, a decision that's being made with the lesson. Like it's understood that we challenge everything, that we're critical of everything. Um, you may find, or you will find if you haven't found um, at your sites, there are plenty of educators who are there for um, the job and not the work. So being able to connect with people in the building is very important. It sustains you. And then also around the country, I've started so many chats, email threads with um, those that I've met at Holly Hot, and we ask each other, hey, I have this lesson coming up, what would you do? Um, or I, went, I ran into this problem with a student, have you ever seen this or heard this before? And we just encourage each other and give each other advice. So Holly Hawk does provide and, and create a tribe of like-minded educators. And then my final bullet. I'm coming, I'm coming, there we go. <laughs> I call this the Popovich and uh, Belichick effect. I, I like this one, Charles. I really like the uh, the sports metaphor here. Yeah, I'm a huge Spurs fan, so uh, I consider Popovich one of the best basketball NBA coaches. And then Belichick, of course, um, so many championships. So the idea um, of this effect is that out of the Popovich tree has come other great head coaches. Out of the Belichick tree has come other great head coaches. And I think the coaching that Holly Hawk provides allows you to observe what it's like to inspire someone's growth, support someone's growth. What I found most of all in the classroom and with coaching, it's about the questions that we ask. So being exposed to the idea that it's okay to spend an hour coming up with the right question for your class that will spark the best conversation, same thing in coaching. The coaches are experts and they know the right questions to ask to lead you to where they believe you should be without telling where, telling you where you should be. And sometimes those questions take everyone in the group to a new place, but being able to observe what questions to ask, how to ask them, when to ask them is very important. So I feel like the coaching that I've received has helped me in my classroom, but it's also um, pushed me and um, inspired me to take more leadership roles at my site. And I would just mention that Charles also has taken a leadership role within the fellowship. Like he led, we have this thing called Beyond LKS, which means basically just evening opt-in sessions. And um, Charles led one of our most popular ones uh, this past summer. I don't know, Charles, I think we had like 50 people there. And we had really deep conversations about race and teaching and pedagogy and um it was just transformative and so i think there's not only leadership opportunities like charles talking about it is at your school site but also within the fellowship um as as well so charles do you have anything else you want to add before we go to q a no that was it i appreciate it thank you charles i really appreciate it too so now we're going to go to questions um so you again you can put them in the chat and then molly will bring those up for us. Molly, do we have any uh, questions yet? So for now, uh, I have a question for Charles. And um, it is, uh, you're wondering if um, you could expand on how your practice has grown in your classroom. Sure. Um, so um, in my first couple of years of teaching, it seemed like everything was moving so fast and anything that my chair told me or my coach told me, to me, it was Bible. You know, it was a matter, first of all, of getting my footing, but also keeping my job and making a good impression. You go through all of those things early in your career. Um, I think Holly Hot came at a time when I was ready to question certain things and push back on certain things. So it empowered me to take a lesson plan that I felt like was not getting to the heart of an issue or motivating my lower students or not allowing my students to bring their story into the classroom. I was just maybe trudging through or plowing through something because that's what I was quote unquote supposed to do, right? So now 
Um, I take much more time thinking about what's right for my class, what's right for individual students. Um, the most transformative aspect is the discussions in my class. So I went from a teacher-centered classroom where I would stand in the front, give out information. Every student would direct their comments and questions back to me. And then I would either hand that off um, to another student and create a conversation that way, but it would always have to come back through me. Holly Hot encouraged me, taught me how to run student-led discussions. So I remember when I first heard the concept, I thought to myself, not my kids, not at my school. You don't know, you don't know my demographic. You know, that was my initial, um, I guess, hesitance. But starting from day one, I learned techniques to empower them and also teach them to listen and speak. So now I can put a question or I can put a series of questions up on my projector. They come in and I let them know that they need to get through these four questions over the next 30 minutes and they know how to take the lead, someone facilitate. They know how to build off what someone else said, push back against what another person thinks. Stop, pause, let's talk about this for a minute, then come back. Um, encourage each other, why aren't you riding? You should be taking these notes while we're talking. All of those things that I thought I had to do um, all the time, slowly that lift went on the students and I'm seeing that that leading to a higher level of learning. In fact, the highest level that you can have, I think is when students teach students in uh, meaningful ways. So. That's been the that's been the biggest uh, transformation I've seen in my room. Thanks, okay. Charles. And if I, I wish I could show a, a little clips of Charles' classroom videos right now to attest to what he's talking about, but mm -hmm. uh, you'll have to take his word for it because it's very true. I'm sorry, Molly. Is there another question? Yeah. Um, someone just asked um, if teachers who are currently in their seventh year of teaching are still able to apply. Correct, and that is correct. Um, yes. You can currently be in your seventh year of teaching and you can apply. Yes, um, you, you'll be starting your eighth year of teaching when you come for the Summer Institute, but as long as you're in your seventh year, you can absolutely apply. Yes, and we have another question. Um, it is, what would make my application a competitive one? Oh, great question. Okay, I'll take a stab at answering that, and then I'd love to hear what Charles thinks, because uh, his school has done a very good job. As you heard Charles say, he's had multiple teams from his school get accepted, so about 30% of the teams that we accept each year are what are called extension teams. I wouldn't say it's very typical that we have three or four extension teams in a row like Charles' school has had. They've been pretty exceptional, but um, it is it is something that we try to do to build on the skill set of the teachers that are currently in the program program to build on to the next one. So Charles, let me take a take a go at answering this question, then I'd like to hear what you have to say. But a couple things make your application competitive. Uh, first of all, if your school team that's applying does not know each other very well, taking some time to sit down and talk about your beliefs about teaching and learning and what you want to get out of the program based on going through the website and seeing what the program is about, maybe, you know, watching this webinar together. Um, I think it's important to have like a theory of change for your school. Like uh, we want to apply together because we all want to work on moving our practice from teacher centered to student centered, or we want to uh, all apply because we think there's an issue of equity of voice, both in the adult learning culture and the student learning culture at our school or we all of us are math teachers. We want to apply because we want to work on uh, vertical alignment in our school. So definitely having kind of a plan as a school team. And then that should um, definitely lead over into the short answer question about why you're applying as a team and also into your video. The video definitely is something that you don't just want to sit like in front of the video screen like an anchor person and read a script. Like you want to be a little more creative about giving us a sense of your school and your community and why you think you would benefit from Hollyhock and what also you would bring to Hollyhock. I mean, one of the reasons why Charles's school has had multiple teams accepted is that the, pe the teachers from those teams have brought a lot to the fellowship as much as they've taken back to their school site. And then finally, I would say, um, cross content teams are more competitive than content one content only and that's only because of a numbers game like we have 
Um, we can accept about between 80 and 90 fellows a year. And that means we want to have between 20 and 22 people in each content area. So if you apply with an all a team of all um, English, for example, it's going to be much harder to get in than if you apply with a more balanced team of history, science, math, and English. I will just be totally transparent and say um, two of the uh, content areas are more competitive than two others. So English and math get um, many more applications than history and science. So if your team leans a little more history and science, just, you know, uh, statistically, you have a little bit better shot of getting accepted. Overall, our acceptance rate varies from year to year based on the number of applications, but our general average has been about 30 to 35% acceptance rate. So basically one in three school teams who apply um, are accepted. Let me turn it over to Charles. It, Charles, any tips on how to make an application competitive? Um, I, I feel like you hit the nail on the head with everything. Um, to be honest with you, I don't even remember. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been a couple of years. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember. But I do remember saying too much. Like it was... I remember having to cut it down over and over and over. It wouldn't, it wouldn't let me submit it. So I think just yeah. being able to state your point, um, your points in a concise way, in a meaningful, genuine way. Um, I think the biggest part is what Holly Hawk, what do you think it can do for you and what you think you can do for Holly Hawk is the most important, you know, like, um, and also being able to maybe have some stories to tell about, uh, your students, your community, where you teach, mm -hmm. those type of things. Um, I remember standing out to me. Um, yep. Yes, I'm really glad you mentioned that last part, Charles, because I think the making it specific to your context and also, um, but, but doing so with an asset leaning lens, I know it can be tricky when you want to share your challenges, but you, because you want to be honest about what you face. I mean, look, we, we know there are a lot of challenges out there. Um, we're very familiar with that considering the demographic that the Hollyhock Fellowship Program serves in terms of schools. But we also um, do want to hear the assets that you think your team brings, your students bring within that specific context of your school. Uh, Molly, we're about at time. So do we have any final questions? Yeah, just one last quick question. Um, who, so someone's wondering who will be coaching the Hollyhock Fellows? Great question. So we have a, a mix of people who coach the Hollyhock Fellows. We have some people who um, work at the Center to Support Excellence in Teaching, which is the center through which the Stanford Graduate School of Education supports the Hollyhock Fellowship. So there are some people who are on staff. All of them are practitioners with significant experience. I don't think we have any coach who coaches for us from that staff who has less than 10 years of experience um, of teaching in schools in similar contexts. Most of them are national board certified. Some of them are both teachers, like Charles's coach is a, is a teaches in the morning at her school and then is a coach in the afternoon, just for example. We then also have some graduate students who are coaches. All of them are um, graduate students who are interested, who were teachers previously. And then after they taught for five to 10 years, they're now in graduate school, learning how to be a teacher educator. So they're another set of our coaches. And then for the first time this year, we have a few alumni that are functioning as Hollyhock coaches as well. Um, they all have, again, eight to 10 years of experience. And so we, we don't have anyone who coaches who doesn't have a lot of experience and expertise, um, just because we don't want to, um, if we have a seventh year teacher, we want to make sure they feel like they're working with a thought partner who understands the depth of their experiences, just for example. Oh, and everybody is content specific experts. Like we don't have anyone coaching in math who hasn't also taught algebra one through calculus a b we don't have anybody teaching in science our, our coaching team is very distributed we like have physics expert a chemistry expert biology earth sciences and then we assign people to coaches based on their content area and the coaches expertise like just for example any other questions molly yeah we have one question here about um other subject content areas and um, what content areas that Hollyhock um, emphasizes um, 
yeah for within, within each content area um yeah or just yeah. if if um world languages educators um would uh be able to apply or if it's just uh content based yeah unfortunately we do not have a world language content area at this time it's definitely something that we would love to have. We just, we have not had um, the donation pathway for that at this time. And so um, we haven't been able to support world language teachers. We are able to support all types of history, social science, all type of science, all type of English, math, and of course, um, L and SPED teachers who feel like they can concentrate into one content area. But unfortunately, performing arts, world language, um, computer science, we don't, we don't have supports for those other ones at this time. All right. Thank you, Melissa. I think those are, those are all of the questions and we're a couple minutes over time. Yeah. So let's go Thank ahead you. and wrap it up. If you have any more questions, you can email us at hollyhawk at gse.stanford.edu. Applications, again, will close on January 15th at Pacific time, 12 midnight. So you have plenty of time. Please reach out to us. We would love to have you apply. And I just really want to thank uh, Charles. It's like dinner hour for him uh, on the East Coast. Charles, thank you for being a part of this. We really appreciate you sharing your experiences. No problem. I was honored. Thank you. And uh, Molly, thank you so much for participating as well. And this will conclude the Hollyhock Fellowship Program informational webinar. We will, uh, we did record this and we will share that broadly. Thank you so much to everyone and have a nice evening.